Hello. I hope you can hear me, because I cannot tell if you can hear me. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, there is still room upstairs. So I think two places, three stairs also. Thank you for being here. Uh, I see a lot of people apparently interested in what gRPC is in .NET. Are you looking to replace your REST APIs with something? <laughs> or you do not know yet? Cool. Uh, today we're going to do a, a deep dive into what .NET gRPC has to offer. Uh, you're going to see a lot of code by the end. Uh, and you also going to have access to the repository that I'm using so you can, uh, you're able to run it yourself. So uh, about me, or not about me, yeah, because, <laughs> because apparently Windows 11 before a talk, it's awesome for the first time. So don't do that. Um, my name is Irina Skurtu. I'm uh, from Romania. Uh, I'm a software architect uh, and a .NET consultant. I do a lot of work around the communities. So I organize a user group and a small, small, small conference in Romania. I teach .NET and I blog. But I recently <laughs> been hacked, so I don't have blog there. Remove the DNS. Um, and recently, it has just been published, uh, Web API for Beginners. So if you know someone that tries to switch from, I don't know, desktop development to web, that uh, might be the book for, uh, for the person. So uh, APIs, right? Because I'm assuming, I'm not allowed to assume actually, so I'm going to ask. How many of you are doing uh, APIs? Cool, a lot of you, all of you. So you're working on their web environments with REST APIs, right? So we have to talk about REST since we're talking about gRPC. Uh, and some people are uh, saying that gRPC should be like in a fight with REST APIs, which is not really the case. So how many of you are doing like fully REST APIs following all the six constraints? with hate OIS and all the ceremonies around it, right? How many of you? A few of you, nice. <laughs> so what I realized during the years is that uh, developers, including me, we're just following a few of the guidelines that REST, REST tried to impose. Basically, REST tried to impose um, the common sense around HTTP, basically, forcing us to use headers, the right verbs, the right status code and such like that. Well, um, we cannot talk about APIs, REST, and the fancy things without talking about a monolith, because <laughs> that's where we started. And apparently, with the modular monolith, that's where we are going back. <laughs> so uh, monolith. I'm going to make a full disclaimer here. Um, I really enjoyed working with monoliths, because everything was very easy you had a huge amount of source code. If you ever wanted something in there, you, can, uh, you could go ahead, instantiate that class, use it, everything was there. And another perk of using a monolith was that uh, long build times. So I remember uh, with bad hardware, build a solution that was huge took uh, a significant time. So I could go away and grab a coffee and enjoy uh, the start of the work. Yeah, so uh, the cons with a monolith is that people say that it's hard to scale. I mean, you can scale it, of course, but not without significant uh, costs. It has bad, uh, bad, bad user experience. It has low, uh, high load times. So, uh, for example, if you have components in your monolith that are not used, you still need those to be working in order for the other components to work. Yeah, so uh, it's easy to start with a monolith, but you have a single code base for everything, which is a bummer. Yeah, so big bill from the cloud providers. So then people started to realize that, well, it's not that cool to work with those. Uh, they, we started to have in .NET, at least, a framework like ASPMVC when we had server side uh, that rendered HTML. But still, it was everything around an Onion architecture. Everything was self-contained. and then. Fast forwarding a few years, we had a front end written in whatever JS, your preference, and a back end that has a database or several da databases. And moving on, 
the future is distributed because now that easy application that consuming that was consuming a backend so an API now it became something like this we have several APIs consumed by the same front end and then the front end or the backend API consumed another ba uh, backend API and we we started to have things that are not so easy to maintain anymore and to orchestrate but we needed those because uh, due to the increase of uh, of the web right now our user users are not willing to expect that hey uh, this takes 10 seconds to load now they will be gone before you have time to figure it out so now we have things like this or at least we could have like uh, node.js talking with a go talking with the dotnet core api and stuff like that which is a poly a polyglot environment but we have rest for everything right and as we see uh, rest is not used as it's supposed to be so rest is in a way the common ground between any other uh, language that we could use inside our system so what is wrong with rest where basically there's nothing wrong with rest as long as we use it for the right purpose because if we have customer facing apis to the outside world we should use it yeah it's not there to be replaced but as many of us started doing microservices, well, the first thing when you start a microservice architecture, or you maybe, I know, you have a monolith and you want to split it. So the first thing that you do, so at least it's what I did, was to say, okay, I'm going to extract this part. I'm going to put it somewhere else. It's going to be a new service. And that service will serve data to wherever it wants uh, to get data from. So what do you do? You create a HTTP client, because that's the first thing that you want to do. Yeah. Uh, create an HTTP client, get data from there, use it, and so on and so forth. We're not talking about messaging system because those are an entirely different story. Um, but the incremental way of basically extracting microservices from a monolith is to is simple like this, step by step. Yeah, HTTP clients, then move it in a messaging architecture and stuff like that. Yeah, so incremental and evolve your architecture. And you'll say that there is nothing wrong with REST. We're going to use REST until God knows when. But there are other technologies out there that we need to be aware of. And one of them is remote procedure calls. And this is a concept that was been around since the 70s. And as you see, there are a few concepts that tend to resurface from time to time. So RPC, as a as a thing, as a concept, will make a system um, behave like monolith in a, transpa a transparent uh, way. So for example, if you look at this code, you will see that we have an order, uh, we have an API or uh, whatever service called, called create order, payment status, we process the payment for the, uh, that order, and then if the payment is successful, we arrange the shipping for it. Yeah, looking at this code, it looks like it's in the same system. I mean, if you're looking at this, you're not necessarily understanding that you're basically doing HTTP calls to somewhere, to an API, yeah? So the code is very familiar for a developer. It has a call a method approach. You're not using HTTP clients to create new requests and to get data from. So uh, basically, whenever we're calling one of these methods, we're going over the network, we're getting data back, we get the result from there, and we do the same every single time we're, we're calling such method. So RPC as a generic concept will make the code look local, familiar to the developer. Yeah, you won't have to orchestrate anything. You do not have HTTP clients to be uh, obvious that you are doing a network call. So it has this call a method, get some data, or send some data by calling a method, and it's prone to errors because it's transparent to us, but its primary goal is to make the network communication transparent. It's like, it's not there, yeah. So what if now we have like a distributed system behave like a monolith and we do not care. Uh, it's the consumer's job to retry in case something bad happens. It's the consumer's job to take care of whatever fault tolerance and resiliency uh, is in your system. Yeah, so fast forwarding a few years, we get gRPC, and obviously G comes from Google. Yeah, it started uh, in 2001, so it's not a new technology. Uh, of course, started internally 
uh, at Google. And then after a few years, they open sourced it. Uh, and then fast forward a few years, 2019, we got it in .NET. Because gRPC is basically a specification that was implemented by many languages. Uh, and .NET was late to the party. <laughs> so it, uh, it has been around in Java, it has been around in Go, but .NET got it in 2019 with a lot of errors around it. The tooling was not good, but now a lot of things have, have improved. So gRPC, uh, it's contract-based. Uh, as we will see, you, we will create a contract that will be the common ground between a consumer and the server. And by using this, we will have no more code references. So we will, uh, won't have like right click, add the project reference to a specific package that lives inside the same solution to be able to use that. So that won't be there anymore. The single thing that is common to any um, consumer and any server that implements gRPC, it's uh, the protocol buffer files that we will see. It uses HTTP2. So basically, if you're still using HTTP1, Nope, sorry, it's not for you. It defeats the purpose. It uses HTTP2, which makes it faster. And due to the way the HTTP2 works, uh, it allows you to have a full duplex communication, like a client and a server streaming in the same collection, which is awesome. And also, it has another thing, which is a protobuf serialization. It works with binary data, so no more JSON, no more uh, things to decode and human read for us. And of course, it's available in many languages. So if you have a component in your system that is written in Node that needs to get data from .NET or from Java, this is good for you. Yeah, so because you have this, this contract that it's known uh, by every single language. And another thing that is very cool is that, that uh, it does code generation out of the box. The compiler, the Proto C compiler, will generate C-sharp classes, C-sharp types for us, and we will be able to just use those. So if you look at the traditional client request, um, so a client requests something from a server, and the server processes the request and responds back. Now in we're introducing something in between, which is this, this interface called Proto, written in protocol buffer syntax. So there's this. So we're basically interrupting the communication. We're making the client aware of what the server has to offer. And the server is basically exposing what it has to offer to the client. Yeah. So the protocol file looks very easy. It has a funky syntax. Uh, funky, given the fact that uh, it's very similar to <coughs> SOAP. It's rather <laughs> uh, declarative. Uh, there are extensions for Visual Studio and JetBrains Raider and um, Visual Studio Code that help you with uh, IntelliSense and stuff like that. So first thing that you'll have to do is to define that, hey, I'm using this uh, protocol buffers three version of the syntax. There is also version two that is not advisable to be used. Um, and you're saying, hey, I want to generate a namespace in C-sharp called my first gRPC. And then I want to generate a package called Fibonacci. The package is used for interoper interoperability. So if you have a node talking with the uh, .NET Core, that will be the namespace that you're going to use. And then you just go ahead and define your services. So services are the actual implementation for, um, for the specific um, types. So service called Fibo, it's an RPC operation called Compute Fibonacci that gets the requester number and returns a Fibonacci result. It's rather straightforward. Say, hey, I have this. It's an RPC method called like this. It has an input and it has an output, right? And the funky thing is that you cannot have like a method without parameters in gRPC. You will have to have a, a type that has nothing in it, but you will still have to have a type, yeah? Same happens for the result, yeah? It returns something even though that something is empty. It has to have a bit of memory. Um, moving on, we define messages. These messages become C-sharp classes, C-sharp types, that we can use in our C-sharp code. And we can define properties using the types that uh, protocol buffer, uh, buffers expose for us. Uh, for example, in your requested number, we have an in32 called number equals one. Well. The equals one, it's not an assignment. We're not assigning to a field uh, the value of one. 
we're basically saying that the number is the first uh, property in the binary string. So if we'd have more, we would add more and just equal two, three, and stuff like that. Or if we want to remove something for versioning purposes, we'll just keep a few numbers and um, add something more. So uh, some other things around gRPC is that it supports gRPC modes. And these modes are basically, um, so some people are called them modes or method types. It's basically types of requests that you can do with, uh, with gRPC. You have unary, server streaming, client streaming, and bidirectional. This happens, uh, these types can happen over a single TCP connection, like we used to in traditional uh, web. And they look very nice. Uh, so Unary, we have a client that initiates a communication to a server that implements the gRPC protocol buffer file, and then the server responds back. How you would define such thing? Just by simply calling, uh, I have an RPC method named uh, Compute Fibonacci, gets an input uh, request number and returns a Fibonacci result. For the next ones, the, the client still has to initiate the communication. So uh, the client says, hey, I want something from you. I want this method. So it opens a communication channel with the server. And the server will be able to send in the same connection uh, several chunks of data. So one single connection and several chunks of data. And if you were to define such a method, you would just put the stream keyword to the part that it's streaming. So in our case, if the server streams, we have to add the stream keywords towards the end. And um, that will be it. If we want the client to stream, we'll just go ahead and add the stream keyword to the part that uh, is in. For example, the client opens a communication channel, sends a lot of data, and it will get one response back. Yeah, so think about scenarios where, I don't know, you want to upload lar large files. You can upload those in chunks over a single TCP connection that, uh, that is opened. Uh, you can also collect data from different servers. Uh, and it's uh, here. If you want to define this, is just by adding uh, the stream keyword towards the part that is supposed to be many. Bidirectional is a combination of the previous two. Just add the stream keyword to the front and to the end, and you're done. Yeah. So let's see some code. First of all, I'm going to make sure that this is visible. Uh, okay, so I have here a lot of uh, small, small projects, one of them being a server project that has even a lot of files that, that they're not necessarily interesting for you right now, but you can look at the code and uh, see for yourself. So if you want to build a service, it's similar as you would uh, build a web API. You simply go and say, hey, I want to add a new project to the solution. And that project will have a gRPC. See, there is already a template. And you give it a name, and you click Next, and basically accept what the default interface shows you. And you'll have a running, working um, service. Yeah, so um, what you can have is a program CS. That's the same program CS that we all know from any other types of uh, projects, web API, MVC, and stuff like that is there. The, here is the place where you wire things. Uh, you have an app settings.json that's there, and it won't go anywhere. Uh, you can, of course, add packages if you want. And as you'll see, one of the packages that is uh, already installed, it's called gRPC SVNet Core. So it already has all the functionality that you need for implementing this. And it has a folder where supposedly your protocol files will live, if you have uh, several of them. And another folder called services, that is basically the actual code, the implementation for th what you define. So what we'll have here is a grid, uh, is the example pretty much that I showed you already. A service defined called say hello, uh, gets a hello request and returns a hello reply. These are types that you can use to populate and, uh, and use, but, for whatever operation you define here, you will have to give an implementation in the corresponding service. So supposedly, 
the service will have every operation that you define that you want to expose, like in here. So once you go there and implement it, you'll see that you have, I'm gonna just delete this for, for a bit and say, hi, I want to pop to override this. And it will show you what you have in the protocol file available for overriding. Yeah, so in here we have the say hello. And inside the say hello, I'm gonna undo this because I don't want you to see me like mistyping. So what we have, we have an input. So it's a type of hello request. And the second parameter that you cannot get rid of. So by default, gRPC comes with this second parameter that you'll have to mock whenever you're doing a unit or integration test for this. This server called context is a wrapper and it wraps the gRPC context and it allows you to have access to the HTTP context on top of it. So thinking about this, we have like the normal HTTP context that we use in Web API or MVC apps and behind it, we have the small gRPC calls. Yeah, so basically we have two levels uh, of uh, headers, of metadata that we can um, can access. Yeah, so once you have this, you'll have to make sure that the services are registered here. See that we have like a map gRPC service, and this is the service name. So the platform will take care of uh, instantiating and access, uh, give you access to this. And of course, make sure that you have add gRPC middleware to this. So basically, a gRPC service is nothing more fancy than a console app than a web API has, yeah? So this is pretty much it. Uh, what else I have to show you? This one, uh, by looking in the project file per se, you'll have here an item group. This is helpful if you want to debug things because usually when you add a protocol uh, file, uh, it's not added in here by default. So you have to make it available to the uh, project. So you'll have to add another line for the protobuf and to include the path where it can find these protocol files. Um, the deal is that as a best practice, whenever you're having gRPC services, uh, you will work with these protocol files to share around. So if you have service A talking with service B, uh, the common ground between them is the protocol file. And the tendency would be to have a copy of the proto file in service A and a copy of the protocol file in service B which is an anti-pattern and a bad practice. Um, what I advise you to do is to have a separate wrapper or separate folder where you keep the protocol files and you will have only one source of truth and just pointing out the, the C-sharp project's path to that folder in order to make those uh, discoverable. Yeah, so once you add this, it's a project that it's up and running with the demo, with the small demo. So moving to our example, we have a server that in our case will expose all four methods and we will be able to use those. So we have a hello, hello, uh, say hello request, uh, one that returns a stream of responses, a stream of requests uh, and uh, bidirectional. Yeah, as you've seen, I'm, I renamed this as being the request to make it more, uh, to make you more aware towards the um, HTTP client server request response pattern. Cool, and once we have this, uh, we can run it and we can call it. So we're able to call it and to test every single part of it just by uh, using, I'm using console apps because that's the best interface for some cases, <laughs> as the best UI. Um, and you say that, hey, um, I'm gonna have a channel. A channel is like a higher, um, ground where you can configure things like, like authentication, compression things, um, response sizes, request sizes for gRPC. And then uh, we get this channel and pass it in to a client, greater, greater client. And if I am gonna F12 in it, I'm gonna show you that this is very funky and low level and modifiable, but not advisable to be modified. Um, this is the code generation part that the gRPC does. Yeah, so basically it will generate a, sta a static partial class called greeter, uh, containing the service name and everything that we, we defined in the protocol file, like in here. 
Yeah, it has a package called grid. It has the namespace server and stuff like that. So it generates a few things for us. One of them being the greeter, greeter client. Yeah, so we're able now to use this client uh, to issue requests. So this client, it will show us what are the methods in the interface, in the protocol file, and we'll just look at the signature, populate fields in there, and just call them. And the easiest thing that I uh, I can do is to show you an instance of the server running. Sorry, not this, but this one. So uh, in here, I'm going to .NET build, .NET run uh, the server. And you'll see that it's simply the console that expects us to make requests. I also enabled, I think, debugger trace logging, just to show that how it discovers things. It discovers the say hello, server stream, client stream, and bidirectional. So all the four methods that we, we have in the interface. And then uh, you see that it listens on these ports, one from HTTP and one for HTTPS. Yeah, so uh, it waits for us to do requests. And on the right-hand side, uh, I will run the console app. Yeah, so I'm going to do like .NET run for it. You see, <laughs> I'm sending this value, an exclamation mark, and I get hello back with this value from localhost 5000 server. So I also added the port in there because I want to demo um, some other things. And one thing I'm going to do on the server side in here is to show you what kind of requests are made. So it says it's an HTTP2 request. It's a POST request. So the thing with gRPC is that you have only POST. No GET, no PUT, no nothing. Just POST. It sends things. Uh, and you'll see that this in here it's kind of a new URL, but it's only the path towards the operation that we exposed. It's a MIME type application gRPC, uh, and uh, it returned a 200 status code. Remember, whatever you are seeing he uh, here, it's at the HTTP level. It's the status code that we all know. It's the MIME types that are available. This is top level HTTP, okay? So this is Unary. So if we look here, um, created a channel, created a client by passing the channel, sending an object, this request that we defined in the protocol buffer file, and simply calling the method and writing it back into the console. That's it, nothing more. It's nothing fancy, yeah? So let's look at the other um, types. The server is still up and running. We don't need it to, uh, to do something uh, special. Uh, we're going to test the client streaming. The client streaming means that the client will be the one that will send a lot of things, chunks of things, to the server, and it will get back one response. So let's do this, .NET run. And as a result, you should see that the server side is like writing things. It, it takes a while. I don't know how... Um, what number I did. I did a for loop that I'm writing it to the console. Say that it's done. So this is the last. Um... OK, so the server side got a lot of things. It says that it executed endpoints. It got values, stuff like that. And the. Hello, I'm not moving too much at least. OK, uh, so. The client said, OK, the, the server received this value as the last value. Looking at the code for it, the client streaming uh, is the same. So it's basically creating a channel and passing that channel to a client that is generated for us. And it's simply using uh, uses um, a try catch and writes thing to the request stream. So I'm going to create the client stream, and I'm going to have a for loop that goes to this value, and then I'm simply creating new types and sending and writing them async to the request stream. This might look funky at first, but uh, in the end, it's just having a connection open in which you just write until you're done writing. So that's the concept behind it. And then you respond, you await the response from the server. And the server will, uh, will respond with only one thing of type response. Writing this to the console and you're done. Yeah. So one thing I want to mention here 
uh, beforehand is that um, try catch and you'll see here that we have RPC exception. So whenever something bad happens uh, in uh, gRPC service, you're catching or you're throwing exception and it will throw exception. And those types are RPC exception that will have st status codes. Yeah, one thing to, to remember that those status codes are not part of the 63 one that we're used to at the HTTP level. These are gRPC status codes. And you'll see there are 16 of them, like aborted, not found, already exists, data loss, deadline exceeded, fair precondition, stuff like that. So you can use that to basically uh, cover ground around the scenarios that you have. So if you, uh, if you say, hey, uh, I want to make this gRPC call, but if I do not get back um, in a timely manner, in two seconds, the response, then this means that you can throw away the connection. It's fine, close it. I'm, I don't need that anymore. Yeah, so how do you do and treat uh, exception is just by looking at the status codes related to the gRPC that comes back. Yeah, so this is one thing that uh, it's worth mentioning. Testing the other part, still the server is up and running, and we're gonna do the server stream, which means that the server will push back a lot of things to the client, and we're seeing things in the client side. I'm gonna do .NET run and run, not exe, run. See, server, it's the same approach, a for loop, and I'm taking the I and writing it back. So the server streams. So we're streaming like string things, but we also could stream like data types, complex types and stuff. And we're here, yeah. And the same happens with the gRPC part, uh, the bidirectional one, sorry. If I run this console that is oh, that run, you'll see that you get both uh, the client sends an I in a loop going to 10 this time, and it receives back the same responses, like send to the, the server, the server receives this. Why does this happen? Okay, yeah, so it sends an I and gets back the same I's. Uh, the thing is that the, the messages are not in a, not ordered, are happening in the same connection, but they're not ordered. It just happens to be order in my situation, but don't expect it to be uh, order. The fact is that when you're sending like a production in data there, yeah, you'll have data that supposedly it's not part of a whole, like chunk of uh, bytes of data from a huge um, uh, file or stuff like that. You'll have to have way in which you say, oh, okay, so this goes here and this goes there to make the whole. So um, there are a few things, tweaks that you'll have to, uh, to do in, if you have such a scenario. So we're done with this. So getting back to our code, um, there are a few things that I need to mention before we, we, we continue. And those things are related to some things that gRPC should do good. I'm not gonna open the, <laughs> this um, because it will take a lot of time to display there. So first thing to keep in mind is that sta status codes at the gRPC level are not status codes, as we know, in HTTP and Web API. Uh, everything that we can throw and treat is an RPC exception. What kind of RPC exception, it's up to us to basically uh, address. We can have uh, request headers, response headers. <laughs> that is not what we used to know. We still have the HTTP ones. Yeah, so we have HTTP headers, accept content type and custom ones, custom ones that we can add. But at the gRPC call, we don't have that anymore. Due to the fact the HTTP2 works differently. Yeah, so what we have is a thing called trailers. That is basically a key value pair that we add for uh, ESGRPC response. And we can have a look at that by looking at our service where I added an example for it. Yeah, so I already told you that the server call context, the second parameter that you get, allows you to access things at the HTTP level and one of them being the request headers, HTTP one, yeah? 
Uh, and then you can get values like the user agent if you're interested in, I don't know, culture, content uh, type, stuff like that. And also you can do things like this. You can extract from there the context that we know. And from there we can access like the user if we want. We can access the claims of the user. We can use of their uh, authorization, authentication details. Um, but this time we have two places where we can add authentication. One of them being at the HTTP level, we all know about that, but we also can authenticate each individual gRPC call that happens somehow inside the single, um, the single, GR, the single HTTP connection. And we can do that at two levels, globally and per call, a thing that we didn't have before with uh, Web API. So getting back to uh, what I wanted to show you is that Per call, we can add things that are called response trailers. And these are things like um, key value pairs called metadata entries that you can add in there and you can mimic basically the, um, the header at the lower level. Yeah, so you can also extract those from the client part from the response just by looking at the same collection type. Yeah, so of course you can um, do something like this. Sorry. You can have something like context dot uh, response headers, uh, response trailers to clear them and stuff like that. Or we can do, hey, uh, I want to get the user context. And from the uh, HTTP context, I want to access the, the request and then to extract things. So anything that you would do in a web API at the context level, you can do it here also because that's not gone. It's there, we just add another a level below it. Okay, um, another thing, uh, it's uh, related to the request headers. Still, we have the HTTP ones, but if we want to send data that is not part of the model, we can send it by adding metadata when we do the call. So it's like some other uh, abstraction on top of it. Okay, now, uh, some things that you might uh, tweak during the development of such service is around uh, compression algorithms. You can use compression algorithms, you can use gzip, you can use uh, your own compression provider if you want. Uh, you can say uh, what is the maximum received message size for the gRPC. So you're referring like per call, yeah? So you're opening a connection and you'll have several calls, gRPC calls. Each individual call can be limited like uh, by using this, max receive, max send, and you'll say, hey, I'm using small data. I want to use just 20K of data. Do there, configure that, and anything goes below that, it will break, and it will show an exception, so this way you can control how, m how much data you're sending for each individual call. And if we're talking, uh, I already talked about this, so if we're talking about authentication types, well, we're talking two places, channel level, which means that in here in the client, we can say what are the credential types that we can use. So we can use insecure because it's like a demo environment, but we can also send claims. You can add authentication authorization in there and you can configure what you send. Everything that is available with the web API is available here too, yeah? So for example, if you want to use our Azure AD or Entra, how is it called now? You can also use that, yeah? So what it matters is that your server knows how to decode what authentication details you're sending. That's it, okay? So what is supported? Pretty much everything. So Sky is the limit. Every scenario is pretty much covered. Um, client certificates, so PFX, PM, FEM, stuff like that. JVT, that's the most common scenario in API, so you can move around here. Um, and since we're, we get this out of our way, what gRPC should do awesome? And when I say should, it's because it doesn't do in all situations, so I have to be fair in it. So one thing that it should do awesome is a thing called gRPC transcoding, yeah? So long story short, 
when you have gRPC services, uh, some people will say, hey, um, nope, can do. I have APIs that are consumed internally in my system, but I also have the same API exposed to the outside world to whatever consumer that I don't know. So I cannot go to gRPC and do that. So what gRPC transcoding will do is to allow you to expose the gRPC service as a REST API. REST. REST API. Yeah, so I have here uh, an API that's uh, super easy. It has a service exposed with a method. Say hello. And what we do is to say, hey, um, I kind of want to have the option of using a get method uh, under this path inside my API. And if you add this along a few, uh, with a few other things, you'll be able to call the service like internally with gRPC methods, say clients, um, say hello, and in your browser. Yeah, because gRPC transcoding uh, is able to translate HTTP one to gRPC service. But in fact, you won't have like a full communication in from the browser to the uh, backend, just because browsers are not implementing this standard yet. If we're talking about the front-end app or a client app that runs in the browser talking with a gRPC service, we're talking about gRPC web, which is a totally different implementation of it. Yeah, so yet we won't have end-to-end uh, -end communication using gRPC. We cannot. Yeah, so um, we have this package called gRPC transcoding that we need to install. Yeah, so, um, and another thing that I will show you is that we can have Swagger, just as we have in REST APIs. So another thing that you have to do manually just once is to go on Google GitHub and get this under the same structure. So there is this structure called Google, inside it's a folder called API, and inside it two protocol files. Uh, yeah, I know you're looking funny, what's this? Yeah, I don't know uh, why. They started to implement this, uh, this spec transcoding that is already available in many languages, but I think they didn't get up to speed with the tooling around it, and you have to do this manually. Grab the files, put it there, and then import it in your protocol uh, file definition. So. Um, in your protocol file, you'll have to say, hey, I'm going to import this because I need it, because this is the thing that allows me to uh, expose this as also a, a different endpoint, which is funky yet. I'm hoping that, I don't know, till maybe next year, giving a go, they will implement this. Yeah, so these two files that we're asked to have here is just a funky rule around this. So that allows us to wrap our protocol um, operations into uh, things like this, get, stuff like that, a patch. We can also have bodies. We can also uh, basically bind parameters values from the URL. Uh, that's, very, that's very nice. But let's see it in action. So once you get all the ceremony out of your way, like pasting the files, importing in your protocol file, installing these packages, uh, you would be able to do something like this, add gRPC and on top of gRPC add JSON transcoding. Yeah, so because what it happens is, is JSON translated to gRPC binary and back again. Yeah, so this runs and hopefully not this. This run on this specific port. And I can do something like this. I'm going to zoom in. So look what I did. Um, I have the local host. This is the port. Uh, and I added in there a path called v1 greeter and a parameter called name. Yeah, so instead of name, I'm just going to say hello NDC. and it gets the request and uh, returns back this. So looking at the server side, you'll see that it runs the transcoding API and it gets this executed endpoint v1 greeter with a name that, got, uh, that is binded from the URL. It said that the request finished, it's an HTTP2, it's a get this time. 
Yeah, so at the browser level from the client, uh, we do this time get requests, yeah, not, not post. But those get translated uh, and in the end are um, uh, becoming binary and from binary again. So once we do this, um, you realize that, in fact, you have gRPC service and you also have a REST service mimicked, right? And what you can do is just to add Swagger on it because that's the way we document REST APIs, right? So we just add Swagger. There is a separate implementation of Swagger, uh, gRPC Swagger. As you see, it, it's 0 0.3, so it's like beyond the inception. It's just started. And what it will do is just it will scan the protocol files, look for the options, and um, extract those in the into the URL. So hopefully I can remember the Swagger page link. I'm gonna reset the zoom. Yeah, so it's Swagger index HTML. That's the root, the default one that I added. And you'll see that the name of the service is whatever that we added, and it exposes a GET request that lives under this specific path. Yeah. The deal is that this parameter here needs, if you have a complex type that you want to bind that to, it will need to be in the protocol file type. So say, hey, I get this, and I'm going to shove it in this specific type that gets called to the uh, gRPC uh, service. If you want, you also can uh, execute it in here. It will work just the same uh, as it works for a REST API. Yeah, so this is gRPC transcoding. And also, you can use like Postman for this if you want to, uh, to execute uh, gRPC. Um, I said that these are things that supposedly go and work with <laughs> gRPC, supposedly. Uh, because just when you, if you have more than one file here, more than one import, and you have more projects that use this protocol file, things will go nuts. Uh, so <laughs> that's why I, I wanted to show you this, and that's why I created a separate project and not use the, the initial protocol file. Um, they have an issue with imports. So if you have this import here and you're using the same protocol file elsewhere, the project won't build try to, fi found, uh, to find a solution around it, but uh, it's uh, beyond me right now. So uh, this is pretty much it with the transcoding part. Uh, so mindful of the time. One thing that I think I didn't show you, uh, and as a long story short, when it first appeared, Visual Studio was not nice at all. I mean, the generated code that lives there and usually lives, I'm going to show you where it lives. So it lives in object, debug, net version, and you'll see supposedly a protocol file. Sorry, not here. It'll be in debug. You should see the protocol file in there somewhere. Uh, in the server, just a sec. Bin, sorry, object, debug. It should generate the files for protos. Yay, finally. Yeah, so the server generates here under this uh, wonderful folder the code that works for us. See, there, there are two classes. One is the type containing all the types and one is the grid gRPC or the service implementation that contains the client per se. Yeah, so if you're not seeing this here so or something is not right, you can delete this and rebuild the project and those will reappear um, magically running, yeah? So I think I told you that with gRPC, you won't have code references, like add project reference, reference the project that you need. So let me show you here in the unary project, uh, looking at the dependency, see there is no project, although we're using the server, yeah? So how we can like make sure that the protocol files are accessible in here? So starting 2019 and now, we have the option of right-clicking a project, and we have something like add, sorry, I'm going to stop this. So right-click, uh, add connected service. It's a funny new option that we have now. So inside that connected service, it's a thing that does wonders for us, add connected service. And it will open up a screen, 
and inside the screen, uh, it will be, we will be prompted to see what reference do we need. We need an open API, a gRPC, or WCF web service. And of course, we click the plus, we select what we want to select, and of course, stay away of this, uh, <laughs> and uh, move and select gRPC, click next, browse until you find the server. That's why I told you that you should have like a separate project uh, where you keep the protocol files to prevent you from doing all kind of spaghetti references in your code. So I'm going to the server part, looking for protocol files, select gridproto.open. And from here, we have to select what kind of things we want here. So whether we want to behave like a client, like a server, like a client and a server at the same time, or we want only the messages. I mean, the types that we define with the keyword message, which are the C-sharp types. Maybe we need only those from uh, in a specific project and we can like help the compiler send the right flags to generate only those for us yeah because basically visual studio doesn't do any magic any more magic than wrap in a visual way the executable that generates code for c sharp that gets uh flags and stuff like that just like dotnet run does you can dotnet run no build in a similar manner you have like proto c flags for c sharp and stuff like that it's all in their do documentation if you ever need it. So uh, client, click finish, and you'll see that it also installs some packages. It won't <laughs> install in my case, but we move on. Um, and one thing nice about using this is that you won't have to think, what packages do I need? I am a client. So what kind of packages? It's client dot whatever, and what do I need? It will do it for you. Yeah. So. This is a thing that I wanted to show you. Yeah, so no code references, no project references. The only thing that is common is the protocol file that travels around. Yeah. Okay. Let's see what else. So done with the gRPC transcoding. Uh, another thing that is really my favorite is about transient fault handling. With the gRPC call, with the channel, you can say, hey, um, in case something bad happens, you should retry and you should retry using this policy. And that's the thing that uh, it's done out of the box with the gRPC client and without us installing additional tools like poly or other tools that you use for transient fault handling. And we're going to go here in the unary part and comment something and uncomment some other things. So going to say, hey, um, yep, not here. Where is it? Am I right place? Apparently I'm not here in the right place. Let's see. Transcoding API. What? What happened? Yep, I'm gonna open another solution just for the fun of it. So we have here in the unary on the server, in here, we have a thing that I will have to uncomment just to make sure that uh, the retries are, are working. So for example, I have the say hello method that uh, in which I will mimic that it throws an error. So how does this server know if it's a retry or if it's the first call to that specific method? It's just by looking at this called gRPC previous RPC attempts. This is a header that is added with the gRPC call. And this is the way that the server looks magically and say, oh, hey, are you retrying now? Or is the first time you were calling me? Yeah, so I'm using this just to mimic that something goes wrong. Yeah, so I'm looking if the header is present, I'm gonna move on. And if it's not, I'm gonna throw an exception with this particular message. So I think in the extras, fingers crossed. Here, yeah. So I have like this, I have a retry policy that I have to configure. I want maximum two attempts. I want to back off a bit. Uh, and I want to treat the retryable status quo as unavailable, which I'm retrying, and the deadline exceeded. You can pick whatever suits your business needs, um, but I'm gonna just use this. So you're saying, hey, in case this happened, so in case you get an unavailable or your deadline exceeded, 
then consider it a retriable and just retry. So what we're going to do is to take this policy and use it with our request. And da -da 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 -da. should work. Yeah, so uh, channel with retry. So <laughs> we're creating a new channel and passing the options. And that options contain a retry policy. Yeah, so this might be a lot of ceremony at the beginning, but when you're calling this from, I don't know, an MVC app, or web API or such, it's done only once in startup and it's easier in terms of uh, what you have to configure in there. So we're passing in the channel uh, to the client and we're just calling say hello, right? So I'm going to stop the server because I think I made the change in there. I'm going to shut it down. I'm going to run it and build again. OK. It listens. And since we don't need this and we don't need this. So here is still a client for a server. And I'm going to .NET run it. It will build. I'm going to show you what happens. Yes, so it looks like we kind of got the response back. Yeah, we called, we, get, we got the response. But look what happened on the server side. Hey, server side. What? Anyways, cool. Uh, you see the red, supposedly, <gasps> what happens? Show me the error. Here, I had to stop it. Yeah, so I get like this, starting to receive a call of type unary, it's called say hello because that's the only method that I had in there. And I got this, hey, an error was thrown. And it said that is an RPC exception called status with this internal status code with a detail called not there, try again. Yeah, so basically it retried itself with us, us knowing, we just saw the response. Stay there. Yeah, so we saw the response, but the client in a way is not aware, it just looks there. So uh, one thing that is very nice is that it happens transparently. We just have to configure it. Yeah, it is there for us uh, and it's transparent. Uh, and you can configure like a retry policy if you want, or a hedging policy, one of or the other, but that's it, yeah? So um, uh, it's a good practice to have such thing because if network fails, maybe second time you will try, uh, things will uh, get together. Okay, so uh, another thing that I, I I will show you, it's around deadlines, or because I have such little time, you're gonna see it uh, in the documentation. What I have to show you is this, translate fault handling out of the box, cool, client side load balancing, Hmm, how cool is that? It's still in the library. It works. So usually when you're spinning up new server instances, new API instances, uh, and you have them in a load balancer, you'll have to install tools like, I don't know, Linkerd, whatever, yeah? Uh, but this thing uh, does this out of the box. So what I'm gonna do is just to stop the server now because the server has that awesome uh, throw exception that we do not want and need now. I'm gonna comment this out. And I say, hey, I will run the server, cool. And then I'm gonna run another server on the another port. Yeah, so I'm gonna .NET run at this URL. And now I'm gonna have two server instances waiting, yeah. Uh, it's waiting on this port and the first console waits on this port. Cool enough. Um, let's run the client, fingers crossed. It got a hello back from 5001, cool. I'm gonna run it again. Run it again, I said. Wow. There is a small catch, let's see. So, yeah, there is the catch that I have to stop this and use the second one because there's a different example. So, uh, request, new request, and this is the one. 
uh, DNS resolver practice channel 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 yes so basically now when we're running the client it will know to balance itself using a balancing uh, policy that we set there you can have like round robin 5000 5000 in one i said what let's look at the policy again so we're saying like this we have to have a balancer address we have a server that runs here and a server that runs here so we have a factory we take that fa factory and we create a channel by passing it in round robin config the channel is called the channel and then we're gonna say that we get the channel pass it in and we should get back the thing hmm. it looks fine to me at least and it is let's check if the boat so this runs 5000 run the second instance 5001 listens cool let's see again fingers crossed if not is documented no it should be like getting this different uh the different uh, port back from here sorry am i no it just stops because the console executes writes and stops and the next time that i'm, I'm gonna <gasps> yes I didn't pray enough to the demo gods. So uh, you see, it balances itself. I don't really know how that happens, but it happens and it's awesome because whenever you want, want to have a new instance, you can create a policy, either to pick first and just pass it on the um, uh, round robin, or maybe why not implement something like three times here, two times there, and throw an exception <laughs> and back again. Yeah, so uh, I'm way above my time. Uh, thank you for uh, listening. Uh, I have the resources like here, so you can download the repo and play around. Um, I'll be around if you have any questions. Uh, thank you for being here. I know it was a lot of uh, gRPC hanging around, so thank you for having me here. <laughs>